Good morning. Welcome to River Hills Church Online. My name is Pastor Mark Ticolvi, and we are so glad you have joined us today. Please take a moment and fill out the Connect card in the comment section below. Prayer matters to us here at River Hills. Take a moment to send your prayer requests either through our mobile app or on our website. The best way to stay connected is through our mobile app or our website. Take a moment to subscribe to us on either Facebook or on our YouTube page. If you would like to support the ministry here at RHCC, take a moment to give either through our online mobile app or through our website. Connection Cafe is a great way to learn about River Hills. Connection Cafe takes place after second service today. Food and childcare will be provided. Today we continue in our brand new series, Exploring Mark. Now let's jump right back into worship. Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. Wherever you are at, we would love for you to join and worship with us right now. No shadow comes without the light making a way. Never define one word of faith. My heart remains sure in the wind, sure in the wind. You are the anchor for my soul. You won't let go. You won't let go. No matter what may come, I know you won't let. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop. Never stop. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to River Hills Online. If you're like me, in fact, if you're like most people, here's something that's true. We all love our little boxes. Little boxes are how we make sense of life. Now, what do I mean? Well, we all put people in categories. So a black person's like this or a white person's like that. Hey, I grew up in Kentucky, and everybody had some attitudes about Kentuckians. When I lived in the New York City area, people said, you're from Kentucky, and they had certain assumptions about what that meant. People had assumptions about Jesus during his lifetime. One of his followers, in fact, said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, we all love our little boxes, but guess what? Jesus doesn't fit in any of the boxes. He blew them up, in fact. Nobody heard anything like he taught before. Nobody had seen anything like what he was doing. Jesus defied the categories, and it's Jesus that we want to engage today and with Mark. Now, what is Mark? Remember, this is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. It is the story that was experienced by Simon Peter. For 30 plus years, Peter would be asked, hey, tell us about Jesus. And it's a story reported by, written down by John Mark. It was written at the end of Peter's life. Peter didn't know he was going to die. He was under arrest in Rome. Nero was no friend to followers of Jesus. Peter ended up being executed. But before that, John Mark, his traveling companion, wrote down what he'd heard many times. He went over it one more time with Peter, and it became for us the Gospel of Mark. And let me remind you one more time, believe it or not, Mark wasn't writing the Bible. 
No, the Bible was later, about 300 years later, what we know as the Bible was collected. Uh, what Mark was doing was actually cataloging. He was documenting. He was recording Peter's experience with Jesus. And where did that, that story come from? Well, it came from 35 years of Peter lifting up Jesus, and everywhere Peter went, people would say to him, Peter, tell us about Jesus. And I could just see Peter settling in and saying, okay, I, I'll tell you, but get comfortable. Do you realize that this story of Mark, this story experienced by Peter, uh, you can read it out loud slowly in about an hour and a half. So can't you imagine Peter on some evening in a home crowded with people and they're saying, tell us about Jesus. And Peter says, okay, here's, here's the story. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And you know how he started the story. I mean, just quickly, he says, hey, Jesus, do you realize he was anticipated in the prophets? He was announced by his cousin John. He was approved by the Father who spoke from heaven. He was directed by the Spirit to go into the wilderness and then begin his ministry. And yes, Jesus was committed to his purpose in the world. In fact, Peter made it clear that Jesus' teaching had a single point of focus. And that focus was the kingdom and its king. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. And why? Because the king is here. Now, Peter, sitting down with his friends, would say, to make sense of this, maybe you have to understand some of the geography. It all started in my hometown of Capernaum in, in Galilee. And Jesus did so many things in that area. And then... Just before he died, we, we traveled south, and that was kind of where Jesus made it clear what he was doing, who he really was, that he was a different kind of king. And then it all ended up in Jerusalem. So the northern events, and then the southern events, and the transition events, it's all about Jesus and who he was, what he was doing, who he is. You see, Jesus, Peter said, was bringing his kingdom, and it's an invisible kingdom. In that kingdom, Jesus was team building, and he was teaching, and he was casting out demons. He was healing and praying and preaching. And Jesus was welcoming everyone, engaging everyone. Last week, we saw that Jesus began his ministry by visiting all the towns around Galilee, preaching and teaching the good news of the kingdom. Jesus, after that initial work of ministry, and who knows, months, maybe even a year, ends up back in Capernaum. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So Jesus was centered in Capernaum when he was in Galilee. In fact, we're pretty sure he was living in the house of uh, Peter and Andrew. He was staying with them. And when Jesus got back into town, his popularity hadn't abated any. In fact, it continued to grow. And so here's what happened. The people gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, I've been to Capernaum several times, and the interesting thing about that city today, it's a, a national park in Israel, is that you can actually see the ruins of the town where Jesus lived. In fact, here's a picture. Uh, I'm taking this picture standing from what would have been the roof of Peter's house. Here's the synagogue in Capernaum, and you see all these foundations I mean, they still exist. And these are the foundations that existed in the time of Jesus. You can see how closely packed together the homes were. And Peter actually lived in one of the larger homes in this area. It was surrounded by a courtyards. It was uh, uh, comprised of several rooms. And it was actually pretty large for Capernaum. And the Bible says in every nook and cranny of this compound, people were gathered. In fact, the crowd was so pressed together, no more people could get in. And it's in this context that Jesus comes back to town and he begins to demonstrate that he is a very different kind of king, that he didn't fit the convention, that he shattered uh, the box, if you will, because Jesus was disruptive. I mean, he was disruptive in so many ways. And what Jesus did, what he taught, both of them together shattered all the expectations. Jesus was unlike anything these people expected of the Messiah. What did he do that was so radical, so different? Well, he forgave sins. That was 
unexpected, and it generated conflict. He ignored religious rules. That was <coughs> unexpected, and yes, it generated conflict. He, he welcomed everyone. In fact, Jesus was uncomfortably comfortable with unrepentant sinners, and that generated controversy. So think about these things. Jesus forgave sins. Now remember, he's at Peter's house. The crowd is so great that the people can't even get near him. In fact, some men came because they knew Jesus could heal their paralyzed friend. So this paralyzed man carried by the four of them, since they couldn't get to Jesus, remember the crowd is dense packed, because of the crowd, they, they made an opening for him in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the man who was lying on that mat. And remember the picture? These houses are so close together. These men made their way onto the rooftops. They burst through the, the packed earth, the clay tiles, the, the wood frame. And right in the middle of that crowd, nobody was going to move. They dropped this man on a mat who could not walk, could not move. He was paralyzed. And then the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith. I mean, these men obviously not only believed in Jesus, they trusted that He could heal their friend. How about your faith? Is your faith on display? Hey, when it comes to knowing who Jesus is and then engaging with Him, the way to approach Jesus is the way these men approach Jesus, by faith, by trusting Him completely, by putting all your eggs in His basket, if you will, because that's what these men were doing. They were trusting Jesus with the need of their friend. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, my guess is when Jesus said that, you could have heard a gasp in the room. What did He say? Sins are forgiven? I mean, who does he think he is? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, maybe not everyone was thinking that. Maybe most of the people said, wow, this is great. But there were some teachers there who were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? I mean, he's blaspheming. Now, if, if Jesus were to say to the man, hey, I forgive you for the offense you committed against me, no problem. We ought to forgive one another. But Jesus is, takes the place of God and He says, your sins are forgiven. And who can forgive sins but God alone? So the religious leaders said, who does this guy think he is? And Jesus immediately knew in His spirit what they were thinking. In their hearts, He said to them, why are you thinking these things? Because you tell me which one is easier, to say that this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But I want you to know, Jesus said, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So He said to the man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And He got up, took up His mat, and walked out in full view of the entire crowd. The hundreds of people pressed into that scene. So here's Jesus doing something no one had ever done before. Not only the healing, but assuming authority to forgive sins, to say, I forgive you is one thing, but to say, God forgives you, who can do that but God alone? And Jesus is God. So this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, never seen anything like that before. Jesus didn't fit the box. In fact, He shattered their expectations because He was able to forgive sins. He had authority. He still has authority to forgive your sins. Another thing that Jesus did that blew people away was, he ignored the religious rules of His day. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, had created so many rules around the law of God that you couldn't even hardly find the law of God. And here's what happened. John and his disciples, the Pharisees, uh, uh, the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came to Jesus and asked, how is it that John's disciples and his disciples, the Pharisees, are fasting? But yours are not. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, in that day, the Pharisees taught you ought to make fasting a part of your weekly routine, going without food to, to seek God. You know, the Bible nowhere commanded that, but the Pharisees demanded that. It was one of their religious rules. And Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm going to do right now, because you, you don't fast, you don't mourn when the bridegroom is here. I'm here. 
Now's the time to rejoice. There'll be a time for fasting, but it's not now. And Jesus certainly believed in fasting. He advocated it, in fact, but not as a religious rule, as a means of deepening your relationship with God. So Jesus didn't keep the religious rules about fasting. But you know, the biggest controversy that Jesus caused was, well, what He did on the Sabbath. In fact, eight different times Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. He did other things on the Sabbath, and there were so, I mean, the Pharisees had so many rules, especially about Sabbath keeping. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. This is right outside of Capernaum. And as His disciples walked along, they began to pick some grains, uh, uh, you know, heads of grains, and, and eat them. Now you think, okay, they're just walking, and, you know, are they, are they doing anything? They're picking up some, some seeds and putting them in their mouth. But the Pharisee says, look what these guys are doing. It's unlawful. You can't harvest on the Sabbath. Well, I'm not sure this would fit anybody's definition of Sabbath harvest, but there they were. And Jesus said, don't you remember there was a time when David did something even more egregious than this? He went right into the temple and ate the holy bread. He fed it to his men. And then Jesus said to him, uh, the, the Pharisees, the, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, wait a minute. Jesus forgives sins, and Jesus is claiming authority to define what's right and wrong on the Sabbath day? I mean, this is amazing. These Pharisees, they just couldn't deal with it because they had built these boxes, and Jesus, He was just shattering their boxes, their preconceived notions of what God wanted, of what was right before the Lord. Another time, Jesus went to the synagogue, and there was a man there with a shriveled hand. And they were looking at Him, and they were just saying, Jesus, are You going to are you going to heal this man on the Sabbath? They wanted to know. Are you going to, again, violate their preconceived notion of what was right on the Sabbath day? And so they're just saying, what's it going to do? I mean, maybe they're even setting him up. And yet, what did Jesus do? He healed the man. Because again, the Sabbath was a time for doing good, just like every other day of the week. Jesus made that clear. And doing good is never wrong. It's never out of season. It's always the right time to do good for others. So Jesus began to break the, the conventions, the religious rules of His day, and it was disruptive to so many people. There's a third thing Jesus did, and that is He welcomed everyone. In fact, Jesus was uncomfortably comfortable with all people. Even the people that were categorized as outside the boundary of God's concern, outside the scope of God's love, they were unworthy. I mean, it showed up in who Jesus spent time with while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Now, this is happening in Capernaum. And, and again, Jesus has called Levi, the tax collector. He went right out of the house where he was uh, healing the man and forgiving his sins and goes along the lake shore. And the lake shore was a business center. It was a fishing industry there in Capernaum. In fact, there were about 330 different fishing boats along the Galilee at that time. And Levi's responsibility was to make sure those fishermen paid their taxes so that Rome could be enriched. And people hated him. They hated him for what he was doing. And so Jesus calls Levi and says, follow me. And he does. And then he goes to dinner at Levi's house. And many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. Now, these were the lowest of the low in the minds of the religious leaders of Israel even the ordinary people of Israel. They were eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus and His disciples, for there were many who followed Him. Now, do you get that? Unrepentant sinners followed Jesus, and He kind of liked it. He enjoyed spending, <coughs> excuse me, spending time with them. And when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw Him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked His disciples, why does He do this? Why does He eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because Jesus loves people, all people. No one is outside the scope of Jesus' love. Maybe today you feel like you've done some things that put you out of bounds, that put you so far away from God once that He could never love you. And I want you to know that's just absolutely untrue. There's nothing you can do to make Jesus stop loving you. Now, there are certainly things you can do to disappoint Him, to hurt yourself, to hurt others. 
But God loves you, and He loves you with an everlasting love. Do you understand that? Because let me tell you something, as much as Jesus' teaching was disruptive, as much as His miracles were disruptive, as much as His compassion was disruptive, let me tell you something, love is the most disruptive force in the universe. And that's what Jesus was bringing, the power of love to His life. So there it is, Jesus disrupting everyone around Him. Jesus shattering expectations. You see, Jesus always generated a powerful response. No one was ever neutral who met Jesus. For some, the response to Jesus was powerfully negative. In fact, as Peter tells the story, he says, you know, Jesus was doing all these things and his, I didn't understand it, Peter said. I didn't understand it. Later, Jesus is going to have to correct me big time. He's even going to call me the devil. But Jesus' family didn't get it. In fact, Jesus entered a house, and again, a crowd gathered so that He and His disciples were, I mean, so many people always pressing around. They weren't even able to eat. When His family heard about this, they went to say, <coughs> we need to take charge of this guy because he's out of his mind. Jesus is out of his mind. He, he, you know, we, we understand that, that they thought Jesus was just crazy. Uh, they, they thought, man... There's something wrong with him. He's insane. That was the family's response to Jesus. Can you believe that? Now later, all his family became his followers. All his family declared him to be God. Now listen, you've got to do something pretty special to convince your brother that you're God. And the thing Jesus did that turned his family around was he not only died for their sins, he rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. Uh, and not just his family. I mean, the teachers of the law were there, and, and they were attacking him now. They had come down from Jerusalem. And they said, he's disrupting everything. He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. So they went beyond insane. They said, he's demonic. So here it is, Jesus generating a powerfully negative response. Maybe, maybe that's how you've looked at Jesus in the past. This is just crazy. He's crazy. Or maybe you think this is something, I don't know, it's just, just off, it's evil. But that was the negative response, but, but it wasn't the majority response, to be honest. For many, the response to Jesus was life-changing, and it was positive. I mean, I want you to think about this. Jesus called many people to follow Him. He expands His team, and, and they did. I've already mentioned Levi. Jesus again went out beside the lake. He just left the house where He's healed the paralyzed man. The crowd again with Him, and He began to teach them. And as He walked along, there's Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at His tax collector's booth. And Jesus looked at him and says, Hey, follow me. Now, Levi is actually Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the man who wrote the first of the Gospels that we have recorded for us in, in what we know as the Bible or the New Testament today. So Jesus says to this guy who was the social outcast, who was the tax collector, who was the sinner, I want you on my team, Matthew. I want you on my team. And Levi followed him. Uh, people followed Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. I mean, this is it. There are people coming from everywhere. Notice this. When they heard about all he was doing, Many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idmania, the regions across the Jordan, around Tyre and Sidon. I mean, everywhere, people are flocking to Jesus because Jesus is making a positive difference in their life. He's healing their diseases. He's telling them the truth about how life works. He's bringing the kingdom. Ultimately, Jesus expands uh, his uh, apostle group. Jesus went up on a mountainside. He called those uh, that he wanted, and, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that he might be with them, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So here it is: Jesus generating a negative response from some, but for the vast majority, in fact, the twelve who followed him most closely, they would rather die than deny their faith in Jesus, and all of them but one did, including Levi, that we see called here today, executed in. Ethiopia for being a follower of Jesus Christ at about age 60. In fact, it's not just people that know who Jesus is. Not only people responding to Jesus, but even the unseen spiritual world. Jesus is driving out evil spirits. 
And the spirits, their response to Jesus was surrender and recognition. I mean, here's Mark 3 again. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and they cried out, You're the Son of God. So whenever a demon-possessed person encountered Jesus, Jesus was going to remove that evil presence <laughs> from a man's life and those people would fall down in surrender and the demons would cry out, We know who you are. You're the Son of God. Do you know that? Who is Jesus to you? And how will you respond to Jesus? You see, in the first century, there were lots of people who were trusting in their system. They were trusting in their box. They were trusting in their, their understanding of religious rules. They were trusting in their values, their beliefs. But Jesus kind of generated a conflict of values, a, a transition of beliefs. And when I look at Jesus and I look at Peter and what he's teaching us, what I'm seeing is it's better to lean on who we believe in rather than what we believe. You see, being a follower of Jesus is not about having the right beliefs. Not that that's unimportant, it is. But it's about having the right relationship. To be a follower of Jesus is always relational. Do you trust Him? Do you love Him? Can you hear the Spirit of God saying to you today and to me today, follow me? Follow me. Why? Jesus says it's because I'm the King. The kingdom of God is near. The King is here. I am God. I am the Son of God. In fact, Peter affirmed that over and over in the story that Mark recorded. He begins the story. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And all through the story, Peter says, Jesus is God. And so we ask him, Peter, man, are you sure? I, can you imagine Peter in that room sitting down with people said, tell us about Jesus. And he says, he's the Son of God. And they say, Peter, Peter, are you sure? And Peter says, yes, I'm sure. I was there. I had a front row seat on everything he said, everything he did. And I was there in Jerusalem when they executed him. In fact, Peter wrote about that experience. Here's what he wrote. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He could have, but he didn't. When he suffered, he made no threats. I mean, Peter's saying, I was there when they arrested him. He didn't resist arrest. I resisted his arrest. They didn't. I mean, Jesus never resisted his arrest. He just allowed this to happen. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the Father's will. Wow, what a great example. And then Peter says, I was there when he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. I was there when this happened. And I was there when he rose from the grave. Do I believe he's the Son of God? Yes, I do. Because I saw Jesus as the King who's unlike anything I expected. Because this is the King who gives up his life for his subjects instead of requiring his subjects to give up their lives for him. This is the King who has given us a new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's Peter. This is good news. Jesus is God. He demonstrated it by all He did, by all He said. Most of all, He demonstrated it through His resurrection. So today, I want you to know, I believe in Jesus, not because the Bible says so. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, not because it's in the book. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus because credible eyewitnesses were there. They saw it happen, and they recorded their testimony in historically reliable ways. I believe in the resurrection. It's good news. So I wonder today, is Jesus good news for you? Is the kingdom of God good news for you? Is Christianity good news for you like it was for Peter? Because if your version of Christianity is not good news, you don't have Peter's version, and you need to upgrade your understanding of who Jesus is. When Jesus began His ministry, He said this, the time has come. It's now. Now is your moment. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
The kingdom is near because the king is here. And I wonder today, who do you trust? Why do you trust? Do you have Jesus in a box, neatly packaged, you think, oh, this is who he is, this is how I need to relate to him? Maybe you need to think again, because Jesus always shatters our expectations. And it's better to lean on him than on a belief system. Better to lean into Jesus than into a doctrinal understanding. Again, I think we ought to believe and understand the truth, but I think most of all, we need to trust Jesus. Do you? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you today that you, uh, you came. You brought yourself to be with us. And Jesus, in bringing yourself, you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, stepped into our world to demonstrate what your kingdom really is. And it's not a kingdom of rules and regulations, although nothing wrong with your rules and your regulations, they're always for our good. Jesus, your kingdom is a kingdom of love, an invisible kingdom of power that someday will fill the entire earth. Lord, in the meantime, we see you and we surrender to you. And we declare, Lord, that you are the Son of God. And we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, wherever you are, I hope you've made preparation to share the Lord's Supper together. The simple bread, uh, the simple crushed vine, the, the, the grape, the wine. Let's pray and let's share communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he laid down his life for us. We thank you, God, that in the upper room, he, uh, he made it clear that the Lord's Supper was important. Important enough, Lord, that he invites us to meet with him. And Jesus, we do that now. We come to you and we surrender. Father, thank you for your presence now in this meal. In Jesus' name, amen. In the upper room, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you remember him? Are you with him now? Let's taste that bread. Let's eat it and see that God is good. Eat your bread now. Jesus, thank you that you are the bread of life. And in the upper room, Jesus took the cup, the Passover wine, and he infused it, he invested it with an entirely new meaning. He said, this is not about past deliverance, this is about eternal deliverance. This is not about what happened in Egypt. This is about what happens in heaven when you put your trust in me. Jesus was about to go out and be executed, and he said, this cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the remission of sins. Jesus said, the price of your forgiveness is my sacrifice. And he said, I'm happy to do it for you. Will you trust me? So let's drink the cup, the cup of relationship, the covenant cup, and remember that we belong to Jesus. We've been purchased by his blood. So let's drink and know that we are God's very own. Take your cup now. Jesus, for the sacrifice you made, we are grateful. Lord, we're not worthy, but we are so thankful for the good gift of eternal life through you, Lord Jesus. We praise you now. Come be with us and fill us as we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The King of Kings is here. The Lord of Lords is Jesus himself, and he is worthy. Just as people in the first century praised his name, he is worthy of your praise now. So let's worship him. Saturday was silent, surely it was through. Since when has impossible to ever stop you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible? Ever stop you? This is the sound of drop. 
bones rattling This is the phrase Make a dead man walk again Open the grave I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling
Once again, thank you for joining us on River Hills Online. If you'd like to support River Hills Christian Church or submit a prayer request or fill out a Connect card, you can do so through our mobile website or mobile app. Thanks and have a blessed Sunday.